الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله جزاكم الله خيرا everybody and welcome back to the stories of the prophets um, the last time we covered the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam all the way up until the point where Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and his wife Sara they went to Egypt and um, obviously the, the king tried to harm Sara but um, ended up giving her a slave girl as a present called Hajar. So Hajar was a slave girl given to Sara by the king of Egypt. Because if you listen to the last talk, because he was he thought that something wrong and I need to just give a present to ward off the evil of Sara. There's no such thing. He was trying to be bad. Anyway, so he ended up giving Sara a slave girl to sorry, Hajar, a slave girl to Sara. So Sara didn't have any children. Neither did Sayyidina Ibrahim Islam. They had no children. So Sarah gave Hajar to Ibrahim Islam to marry. So he married Hajar. And Ibrahim Islam he married hoping to have children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Surah 37, verse 101. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So we gave him good tidings of a forbearing boy of a forbearing boy so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Ibrahim alayhi salam good news that you're gonna have a child and the quality of the child is he's gonna be Halim the Ghulamin Halim Halim is someone who is easygoing he's forbearing he's patient you know he doesn't like jump to conclusions and jump and start you know having a go at you and be aggressive and all that the opposite easy going forbearing relaxed takes into account the situation and doesn't just butt in etc so this is a quality of the prophet ismail alayhi salam he was forbearing and this is a quality that we should try to inculcate me first we should try to inculcate in our own selves that we don't jump to conclusions and we're not aggressive and rough and hard but when something happens take it easy give them a bit of chance to explain themselves give them give them a chance be nice and easy they may have done something for a reason that you don't understand but when they explain to you that reason then you understand and you didn't have to ruin your deeds by saying bad things to that person and some people will say when you tell somebody you need to change your akhlaq and make it into someone who is gentle and kind they say no 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 no. i was born like that i this is my characteristic it's me it's inside me i am like that Fine. You might have been born like that, you might be like that, but there's nothing saying you can't train yourselves to become gentle and, comp and compassionate and forbearing. You know, We need to have that mentality. We can train ourselves to become better. We may have a certain inclination somewhere. I might be aggressive and really get angry really quickly, but we can train ourselves through the Quran, through the Sunnah, doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can train ourselves to um, get better akhlaq. Some people are born with it. Some people are born with it. Now, I'll give you another example to show you. Are we born with the ability to read and write? We're not. We train ourselves to become able to read and write. So you can train yourself to read and write. We can train ourselves to um, have more compassion and, and more mercy and be more halim, forbearing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us this beautiful characteristic of being forbearing. Ibrahim was 86 years old when Ismail came and I want you to want to pause there and speak to those people or appeal to those people who will know this fact that if, if you are married you have children if you get children straight away and you have four, five, six children and it wasn't ever a problem then obviously you love your children and you value all your children but go and compare it to somebody who has been married for 15 years and they don't have a child and every night they do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child and after 15 years Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them a child what's the value of that child in the in the eyes of those parents it's much more because wow we've got that one child after 15 years let's look after it let's try our best to nurture him correctly and give him good adab good akhlaq etc then what about Ibrahim alayhi salam 86 years and one child came so I want you to think and remember this as we're going through this story. It's a child of great value to Ibrahim alayhi One day, 
Ibrahim Islam, he took his wife Hajar and his son Ismail Islam, who was about two years old by now and he took them away took them on a journey on a journey far away going away going away in the middle of a desert they were just in the middle of an empty desert I don't know how long it took them to get there but they were in the middle of an empty desert nothing just the sun and sand he, and they took with them some dates and some water so Hajar had some dates and some water Ibrahim al -Islam left them there and then started walking away leaving them there started walking away walking away walking away what do you think came into the mind of Hajar just imagine you go just imagine a husband a wife and a child they go on a holiday to the mountains and then the, the, the father he just gets in his car, starts packing his things and going away. What's going to come into the mind of the mother and the child? What are you doing? What are you leaving us here for? There's nobody here. So this is what Hajar said. When Ibrahim Islam is going away, he's walking away. Hajar is saying, what are you, where are you going? What are you leaving us for? There's nothing here. You're leaving us behind and there's nobody. There's nothing. What are you doing? Ibrahim Islam, he continued walking and he didn't even look back. They didn't even look back. Then Hajar said something. He said, Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do this? And he said, Yes. Then she said some golden words. She said, He will not let us get destroyed here then. If Allah has commanded you to do that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't let us get destroyed here. She obeyed and um, submitted to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so did Ibrahim alayhi salam leaving his child, his value, value, valuable child and his wife there, valuable as well, by themselves in the middle of a desert. So he went far, he went, he went uh, between, he went to a narrow mountain pass, he turned around, he faced the Qibla, he raised his hands and he made a dua, which is in Surah 14 verse 37, he made a dua, our Lord I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house, our Lord, that they might establish the prayer. That they might establish the prayer. So make hearts among the people inclined towards them and provide for them from the fruits that they might be grateful. So Ibrahim al-Islam, he turned around towards Qibla and he raised his hands. He raised his hands. And from this we learn that it's excellent to, whenever we need something, to face the Qibla, to raise, if we can't even face the Qibla, then raise our hands like a beggar. Because we are all beggars in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go to those poor countries and you see those people, please give me some money, please give me some money, like that. But we're like doing like that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And regarding this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in an authentic hadith, Verily, Allah is munificent and generous. He would be shy when a man raises his hands to him that he would return them empty and disappointed. That he would, he would turn them away empty and disappointed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shy that when somebody asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raising his hands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like, he's shy that he return them empty and he return the person disappointed. So this is the way to do dua, I mean raise the hands, do the dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us something inshallah. I just want to go back to that verse. He said, Ibrahim alayhi salam said, I left my descendants in uncultivated valley near your house. Why? What was the first answer? What was the first thing he said? Why did he leave his family there? That they may establish the prayer. That they may establish the prayer. This is what he's leaving. This is the first thing Ibrahim alayhi salam said. I've left them there that they may establish the prayer. In fact, he didn't even say anything else. No other reason. And this shows us the importance of Establishing the prayer in our lives. Are we reading Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, five salah at their proper time, even when we're at work, even when we're on the aeroplane to another country, even when we're shopping in the marketplace, do we find time? Do we go at a certain time where we can read all our salah? Because we will see through the lives of the prophets establishing the prayer and the obligation to establish the prayer, or when it was mentioned, it was mentioned at really, really important times. So this is the most important um, act for us to do is to establish the prayer even though we be bad everybody be bad but don't miss the salah because even worse than 
pretty much every other sin except shirk. So, Ibrahim alayhi salam is gone. Hajar and his um, son, her son, Ismail alayhi salam, they at this place in the middle of a desert. desert. The water runs out. <coughs> Their dates run out. The dates run out. Ismail alayhi salam starts crying. He starts weeping. He needs food. He wants food. Two-year-old baby. He's curling. He's hitting the, the, the floor with his feet. Hajar, the mother, couldn't see Ismail alayhi salam like this. Nobody can see their child crying so much. They'll go downstairs and try to get some food, make some food. Doesn't matter how sleepy they feel, etc. But in this case, they were in the desert. There was nobody else there. So she couldn't see her child like this. So she climbed up a mountain, small mountain called Mount Safa. So she was in Mecca. So she went up to Mount Safa. To look to see if there's any help. You go into a higher place to see if there's any help. No help. She went down. She wrote, you sort of took her robe up. And then she ran. And then she went to Marwa, another mountain. Small mountain. She couldn't see anybody. She went down again to Safa. And then to Marwa. And then to Safa. Marwa. Safa. Marwa. And we all know this to be the Sa'i. Which we do in Umrah and Hajj. Where we go to Mount Safa. And we follow what she did and then we get to a certain point and we run like she did and then we go to Marwa. So this is something that she, she was obviously worried at that time and maybe panicking or worried. She didn't know that we'd be doing this, the Ummah of Rasulullah Wasallam would be doing this sunnah of hers. So on the seventh time when she was at Marwa, she said to her, you know, she heard a voice. She heard a voice. So she said to herself, be quiet. And then... She said, I have heard you, but do you have any help with you? I need help, basically. Do you have any help with you? And then she looked at where her baby was, and she saw Jibreel digging with his heel or with his wing at the, where the feet were, or, yeah, digging where Ismail was, and water started coming out. Water started coming out. Remember, this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave um, the mother and her child there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now providing for them. So when she saw the water, she came, she made, a, she made it into a pool, she stopped it, worrying that it's all going to get wasted here. So she was saying, zam, 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 stop, stop. So she wanted the water to stop. She didn't want it to, you know, flow off, flow away and then finish. So she wanted it all to just remain there so she could drink from it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, may Allah bestow his mercy upon the mother of Ismail. Had she let zam, zam flow, had she not stopped its water, then Zamzam would have been a flowing stream. It would have been a flowing stream in Mecca if, she, if uh, um, Hajar hadn't stopped it. But she stopped it because she worried that it would finish. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it to be. So now Hajar has water. And with water you can survive longer. You need water in the desert. Anybody been to Mecca, it's boiling. So you can survive with water for a certain amount of time. Normal water. Well, obviously now she needs company. You need company, you need company, you need shelter, you need, you know, you need to socialize, you need to have friends. So, there was a tribe called the Jurhum tribe, Jurhum tribe. This was a, a tribe that was passing by this area and they saw, from far away, they saw a bird in the sky. And they knew that this bird flies around where there's water. But they knew of no water, then it was like... What's that bird doing there? There's no water in this land. We know this place. There's no water here. What's that bird doing there? So they sent one or two of their people to go and check out that what is that bird doing there? Is there some water? What's going on? They came back and they told the tribe that we have seen there's a woman there with her baby and there's water as well. So it's like, whoa, there's water there. Let's go. So this tribe, big tribe, I don't know how big it was, but you know, men, strong men, and etc. What you would understand from a tribe, they went down to this place where Hajar was, and they asked Hajar a strange question. It was a noble tribe. They asked Hajar a strange question. They asked, "Do you allow us to stay here?" Now, who was Hajar and, and the baby? Of course, it was Prophet Ismail Islam. Were in front of this tribe, this great tribe. This I don't know how many people there were, but it's going to be a lot. They gone up to her, they could have just shifted her to the side and said, right, you stay there, this is all our place, go from here. But they asked her and they said, do you allow us to stay here? And what Hajar replied was even stranger. She said, yes, you can stay here, but I own the water. 
you can stay here but I own the water the water is mine meaning you can't take ownership of this water this water is mine yes you can drink from it but it's mine so she was not even in a, in a position to bargain with this tribe of Jurhum but she did and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped her because she feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran in um, uh, Surah 65 verse 2 That's verse 3 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and this is a pertinent verse to remember for anybody in any situation of their life and whoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him he will make a way out from him and he will provide for him from sources he could never imagine I'll read that verse again and whosoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him he will make for him a way out to get out of every difficulty and he'll provide for him from places he couldn't have even imagined so imagine now Ibrahim al Islam obeyed Allah's command then Hajar when she found out it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command she obeyed it she didn't say why me why me why is it me why is it only us why do we have to do it she accepted it and submitted and look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her. He gave her water that she owned. And he gave her people um, who lived with her. And obviously her status would have been amazing because she owns the water. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for his slaves. Even if you're working in a job that is haram. I know people, they work in a job and they weren't allowed to read the salah, for example. Somebody is not allowed to read his salah. He, will, he left that workplace. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a better workplace where he could read his salah. When we leave something, it's mentioned in the hadith, rough, rough meaning, when you leave something for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides you with something better. You may have all experienced that in your life, where you left something for Allah's sake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced it with something better. Doesn't mean it's going to be replaced straight away, it might take a year, it might take two years, but you'll get it. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also said that he makes a way out for people who fear him and from places they could have never imagined subhanallah so Ismail alayhi islam he's getting older now he's getting older he's learning arabic he's understanding it the people were arab tribes so he's understanding that he's speaking arabic another trial came to ibrahim alayhi islam another trial after a long time he had a dream that he's sacrificing his son so basically when the prophets had dreams they were true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inspiring them through their dreams so he's having a dream he has a dream that he's sacrificing his son so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Ibrahim alayhi islam to sacrifice his son in verse uh, in surah 37 verse 102 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says roof meaning and when he i his son was old enough to walk with him he said oh my son I have seen in a dream that I am slaughtering you. So see, what do you think? He's asking his he's asking his son a question. I have seen a dream, I'm slaughtering you. I need to slaughter you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me with that. What do you think? He's not asking him what do you think because he's waiting for his answer that um, you know, if you're happy I'll do it, if you're not happy I won't do it. No, 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 no. This is Ibrahim alayhi islam. If you know what happened in the life of Ibrahim alayhi islam, he challenged the idolaters all by himself, etc. etc. He was a tough warrior. He was a tough warrior, strong man, super strong man. He's asking his son, letting him know that this is what I'm about to do. His son, the answer his son gave, gave Subhanallah, needs to be written in gold as well. He said, it's mentioned in the Quran. He said, "Ya abatif al ma tumar, satajduni insha Allahu min al sabidin." He said, "Oh my father." He said, "Ya abati." And Ya Abadi, you normally say Ya Abi, which means, Oh my father. But he said, Ya Abadi. Ya Abadi is like a beautiful way. My beloved father. So, Oh my beloved father, do what you have been commanded to do. Insha'Allah, Allah willing, you will find me from the patient. Look at the answer of his son. He's about to get slaughtered. He's got all his life ahead of him, but he's about to get slaughtered. He doesn't think about that. He knows it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. He's ready to put his life on the line, and he does. Puts his life on the line. So this is a family of people who obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the father to the mother to the son. Amazing example and role models for us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do something, what do we do?
In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the Quran, in um, Surah 33, verse 36, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدَ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا A beautiful verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is not befitting for a believer, man or woman, when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter that they should have any option in their decision. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, he has indeed strayed into plain error. And this verse is so important in this time of social media and so much haram happening everywhere. Difficult to get away from it. If you have a mobile phone, there's so many apps of so many haram things, more haram things than good things. Okay, so the society, you know, shaitan, his new sort of areas from attacking and influencing people. So when we are told that something is obligatory to do, whether it's the hijab, whether it's the beard, whether it's, you know, um, not doing business in that haram thing because it has interest, not um, being allowed to sell alcohol because it's haram for us. When we are told about something, it's not befitting that we say, oh, but, you know, you know, I'm not, I don't feel, you know, I don't feel like doing it and it just doesn't fit my style and why should I wear a hijab? Look at everybody else, they're wearing this. Look, everybody's got alcohol shops, you know, what, what are you telling me for? It doesn't fit with me, I'm not ready for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it's not fitting for a believer, male or female, that when Allah and his messenger have decided a matter that they have any say in it. It's not befitting, it's not right that we have a turn around and say, oh, you know, why should I do it? This it's not right. And or not, it's not right. That's even worse saying that. But if you say, oh, you know, it's not my style, or why do we have to do it? And we shouldn't have, we, we don't have a say in the matter. We are sold to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who's allowing that heart to beat? Who's allowing that, uh, the, the breath to go in and come out? Those people who have had coronavirus and who were struggling to breathe, may Allah subhanahu wa protect us, who had to go to hospital, if you ask them, they will tell you just one breath is so, so precious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it us day in, day out, day in, day out. He gives us our life, He gives us our house, He gives us our wealth, He gives us our hands. Everything we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we turn around and say, why me? Why do we have to do it? It is not befitting. Rather, if we struggling with it in our iman, struggling with doing this action, then we say, I'm weak at the moment, I should try, I'm going to try, I'm trying, I'm weak, but I should do it. Now, that's a better attitude, rather than justifying it and saying, why do we have to do it? It's not, it doesn't fit in my style yet, it doesn't fit, I'm going through a journey in my life, I'm not going to wear the hijab yet. We shouldn't have this, you know, so this is something we think about, this verse, and think about uh, this beautiful family of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and we realize that they, as soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it, they said, we're going to do it, basically. So, Ibn Ismail al-Islam's reply was beautiful. Um, um, so, in Surah 37, verse 103, it's mentioned, Then, when they had both submitted themselves to the will of Allah, and he had laid him prostrate on his forehead, so he was laid now on his forehead, or on the side of his forehead, for slaughtering, Ismail Islam is in, lying down in that position. The knife, Ibrahim Islam didn't didn't uh, you know think about it and say, like, well, why should I do it? Why is it me? Why am I get tested? What's going to happen?" He just went for it. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made it that the knife won't work. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took out the power from the fire to burn him. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has taken the power out of the knife. Um, to harm Ismail alayhi salam. It was a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was being tested. Verse 104, we called him, we called out to him, O Ibrahim, you have fulfilled the dream. Verily, thus do we reward the doers of good. Verily, that was indeed a manifest trial. And we ransomed him with a great sacrifice. So Ismail alayhi salam wasn't slaughtered, but instead a ram. A ram was slaughtered. And this is the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam that we do when we go to do Hajj, we sacrifice an animal. So this is the sac following the Sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Verse 108, and we left for him, I, a goodly remembrance among the later generations. Salam be upon Ibrahim. Salam be upon Ibrahim. And Salam is on Ibrahim. I'm saying 
that verse is finished. I'm saying now, Salam is on Ibrahim. Where do we send blessings? Salam on Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Oh Allah, send um, salah on uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his family like you sent salah on Ibrahim alayhi salam and his family. Oh Allah, bless the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his family like you blessed Ibrahim alayhi salam and his family. We say this in salah every day. So salam truly is on the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that's where we will end it for today. And uh, next week we will continue and complete the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.